Falcon Physician Review's Neurology Review Session. The next module will cover trophic factors, glia, and CSF. Cells either adapt or die in the nervous system. And one of the currencies of allowing these cells to be rewarded for good behavior and punished for bad behavior is to either give or withhold trophic factors. Two of these growth factors are nerve growth factor and brain-derived growth factor. If a cell fires another cell, it tends to be rewarded and the strength and the uh, connection between those two cells is strengthened. This is the way that the brain is able to uh, use highly efficient, um, to strengthen highly efficient circuitry and to uh, weed out inefficient circuitry. Brain metabolism is uh, done is uh, primarily uses glucose. It can use keto acids uh, if necessary, but the primary source of energy in the brain is glucose. There's not a great deal of uh, glycogen storage in the brain, and therefore the primary source of glucose is from the blood. So an area of activity tends to increase blood flow to itself in order to get more glucose to that area. This is uh, fortuitous for uh, nuclear medicine studies such as PET because one can make a uh, positron emitting uh, glucose molecule which will then allow you to see what areas of the brain are highly active. The glia of the brain or the central nervous system include astrocytes. These have a star, there's, these are so named because they have a star shaped appearance although more recent studies staining the uh, membrane of the glia instead of glial fibrillary acidic protein, which stains the cytoarchitect or the cytoskeleton of the, of the astrocytes. These, cell, these uh, dyes that stain the membrane of the astrocytes actually make these cells look more like a bush rather than a star. The processes of the astrocytes tend to terminate on end, end, as end feet on surfaces of the blood-brain barrier. In so doing, they increase the uh, the impermeability of the blood-brain barrier and assist in transporting wanted mo molecules from the blood. They also provide structural support to nerve cells and they will proliferate and repair after damage to nerve cells, uh, to injury, or injury to nerve cells. The problem with the ability of these astrocytes to proliferate is that they are the primary source of primary brain tumors such as astrocytomas. These are astrocytomas, such as glioblastoma multiform, the most undifferentiated and rapidly growing uh, primary brain tumor. These cells also will help uh, act as a sponge to clean up some of the neurotransmitters and ions that have been broken down in the process of synaptic transmission. So therefore, they keep a very pristine environment in the ner central nervous system to allow efficient neural transmission. Here's an image of astrocytes uh, with their end feet uh, terminating on uh, capillaries of the brain and contributing to the blood-brain barrier. These cells will, fa will facilitate the transport of needed nutrients into the brain. Another type of glia, glial cell is an oligodendrocyte or oligodendroglia. Oligo meaning few and dendro meaning branches. These cells have fewer and thinner branches than astrocytes. Their function is to form myelin in the central nervous system, and they may be involved in complex and metabolic in exchanges with nerves. As opposed to the uh, Schwann cell in the peripheral nervous system, where a single axon is myelinated by a single Schwann cell, oligodendroglia could be thought of as the player of the nervous system, where they have their arms wrapped around several honeys or around several different uh, axons. Oligodendroglia form myelin in the CNS, and one can see right here a picture of oligodendrocytes wrapping around several axons. In addition, glia, uh, another glia, glial cell in the central nervous system is microglia. These are small and scattered throughout the nervous system, and after injury or degeneration, they will transform into large macrophages and move to the site of injury and bulldoze and degrade the, uh, the, the products of the, uh, the, the damage. So these can be thought of as the major construction workers of the central nervous system where they will, where they will remove large areas of damage. The astrocytes tend to uh, remove uh, and clean up the area in small, uh, uh, with things, removing things such as ions, 
the microglia will actually remove the large breakdown products. Here's an image of the microglia. These are the smallest glia until they transform into large macrophages. Here's a comparison between Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes. In Schwann cells, they myelinate one internode of one axon, whereas oligodendrocytes will myelinate many axons using one process for each internode. Here's a comparison between Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes. In Schwann cells, they myelinate one internode of one axon, whereas oligodendrocytes will myelinate many axons using one process for each internode. Looking at the nerve sheet, the uh, nerves are covered with several different layers of uh, coverings. The endoneurium is a thin layer that surrounds axons themselves. The perineurium is a dense connective tissue that will surround each fascicle of the nerve. And the epineurium is a loose meshwork that surrounds the entire nerve. These nerve sheaths are con continuous with the central nervous system meninges where the epineurium is continuous with dura, the perineurium is continuous with arachnoid matter, and the endoneurium is continuous with pia mater. Dura mater in the central nervous system is a dense fibrous uh, tissue, and its outer, outer layer will even function as the periosteum for the bones that cover the central nervous system. Arachnoid matter, on the other hand, is a delicate layer of collagen fibers, and these normally line the inner surface of the dura. The pia mater adheres directly to the surface of the central nervous system, and these are, these are also made of collagen fibers. The blood-brain barrier is a very important uh, feature of the central nervous system, and every pharmaceutical company that's trying to make central nervous system uh, active medications needs to deal with the blood-brain barrier. So it is an area of active research on how to get wanted molecules across the blood-brain barrier. It is made by tight junctions between endothelial cells. It's also made by the foot processes of astrocytes, which will assist in the, want, in the transport of wanted material. So in some ways, it's like a New York club where you have a velvet line keeping all the unwanted folks out and a big bouncer saying who can come in and who cannot. Most are not allowed to pass. But if you're small and lipophilic, you can think about getting in. If you have connections on the inside, you may also get in. And in this case, for the central nervous system, these are, these are molecules that have their own transport system, and that astrocyte will let them right in, will open up that velvet line and say, come on into the central nervous system. These are glucose, amino acids, and nucleosides. So, uh, CSF, or cerebrospinal fluid, is created in, this, in the choroid plexus. This is, could be considered an ultrafiltration of blood, although there are also secretions into the CSF, and this is a very tightly regulated fluid in the body. It is crystal clear in the normal state. The flow of CSF would start from the choroid plexus, entering into the lateral ventricles in most cases, although choroid can be seen in many different ventricles, but let's start in the lateral ventricles and follow the flow of CSF here. From the lateral ventricles, the fluid uh, is transported across the foramen of Monroe, where it will enter the third ventricle. From the third ventricle, it will pass through the aqueduct of Sylvius and into the fourth ventricle. From the fourth ventricle, it is able to exit through two different uh, means. One is the foramen of Magendi, and the other is the foramen of Lushka. There are two foramen of Lushka. There's one medial foramen of Magendi. It's fortunate that these two gentlemen uh, chose the, the particular uh, openings, Magendi choosing the medial one and Lushka choosing the two lateral ones. That helps medical students for many generations. Here's an image of the CSF flow showing the lateral ventricles, foramen of Monroe, the third ventricle, the aqueduct of Sylvius, the fourth ventricle, and the foramen of Lushka and Magendi. But CSF is not quite done with its travels yet. It has to uh, travel around the brain and bathe the brain before uh, exiting into the venous system. And some of the major cisterns are the places where CSF accumulates around the brain when it's outside of the central nervous system, outside of the ventricular system. 
The interpeduncular system is between the two peduncles of the front of the midbrain, uh, the cerebral peduncles, and therefore it's aptly named the interpeduncular cistern. The pontine cistern is just in front of the notch that is in the base of the pons. Quadrigeminal cistern is in the back of the midbrain. This is where the four colliculi, or corpora quadrigemina, are located. Therefore, the quadrigeminal cistern is there. And we use the quadrigeminal cistern as a neurologist when we want to get a sense of what kind of intracranial pressure uh, may be seen. If there's a large amount of edema in the brain, one of the first places we can see on imaging that may be compressed would be the quadrigeminal cistern, which would certainly argue against doing a lumbar puncture. Would not want to do a lumbar puncture with increased intracranial pressure because it may lead to herniation syndromes. The cisterna magna is a CSF cistern that's just found below the cerebellum. CSF is resorbed into the venous sinuses using the arachnoid granulations. These are pouches of arachnoid matter that, tra that, uh, that go through the dura and into the venous sinuses. This allows CSF to get from the uh, subarachnoid space and into the venous blood system. Looking at this image, one would think that there may be something wrong with this brain, but it's not the case. This is actually a normal structure. This is with, uh, one doesn't usually see a brain that still has the dura intact and the arachnoid granulations, which is the cauliflower-like structures that you're seeing at the top of the brain here. We're looking down the interhemispheric fissure, and you can see the false cerebri, the tough dura mater uh, tissue that's separating the two hemispheres. Just above that would be the superior sagittal sinus, where these arachnoid granulations were pouching through to reach the venous blood system. Meningitis may end up scarring these arachnoid granulations, which can cause a hydrocephalus. It would be still considered a communicating hydrocephalus, even though there's a blockage of the arachnoid granulations. The difference between non-communicating hydrocephalus and communicating hydrocephalus is whether the, whether the CSF makes it out of the ventricular system or not. So as long as it makes it out of this ventricular system, this would be a communicating hydrocephalus. But if it's blocked from within the ventricular system, such as aqueductal stenosis, cerebral aqueduct is blocked and CSF cannot make it out of that system, that would be a non-communicating hydrocephalus. There's about 150 cc's of CSF in the central nervous system at any one time. 50% uh, of that is in the ventricular system and 50% would be in the spinal system. When we do a large volume tap, even one of our largest volume taps would be around 30 cc's of CSF. So we're never really tapping a person dry. We're taking only a small percentage of that CSF. But the CSF is recycled three to four times daily. So usually the person will replace that uh, removed CSF um, in rapid order. However, uh, lumbar punctures may lead to a leak in the lumbar cistern, which can lead to post-LP uh, headache or low pressure headache. So at times if this headache continues, we may have to seal up that leak that may have been created by using a blood patch. We take about 20 cc's of the patient's blood and inject it into the, into the space uh, where the lumbar puncture was done. And this may create a fibrous patch that may block that leakage. Let's do a clinical vignette. A 60 year old male is seen by a neurologist for an evaluation of deteriorating cognitive skills. Over the past few weeks, the patient has stayed in bed and has had urinary and bowel incontinence. On physical exam, cognition is impaired. He has impaired ambulation without evidence of primary motor, sensory, or cerebellar dysfunction. This is termed a gait apraxia. Uh, the patient has deep tendon reflexes that are intact. His pupils are equal around reactive to light. The plantar responses are bilaterally flexor, and his fundus does not reveal any papilledema. This triad of symptoms where the person is incontinent, incontinent, has trouble walking, and has cognitive decline is suggestive of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is a bit of a misnomer because if you were able to record over a period of time the CSF pressure within the ventricular system, you would see spikes of, blood, of CSF pressure periodically. And this does stretch the fibers that are coursing around the ventricles, and this may lead to the type of uh, symptoms that this patient has. Um, 
what we do for it. Uh, we need to evaluate it. We may do a large volume tap and see how the symptoms respond. Uh, there may be a lumbar catheter placed and monitor and prolonged monitoring of the patient. The eventual treatment is a uh, ventriculoperitoneal shunt, which may allow a, a more efficient route for the CSF to leave the, uh, the lateral ventricles and to avoid these large pressure spikes in CSF that occur intermittently. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, you usually won't see a, uh, you won't be able to catch the spike when you do a lumbar puncture, so you may not be able to see an uh, increase in CSF pressure but certainly uh, uh, a large volume tap may improve their symptoms. Another clinical vignette, a nine-month-old infant is brought to his family physician because his parents are worried that the child's head appears too large. The mother had an apparently uneventful pregnancy and delivery. At birth, the child's body weight had, and head circumference were at the 65th percentile, which was normal. On physical exam, the, the infant is lethargic and irritable, has an anterior fontanelle that is bulging. When pressed slightly, it immediately pops back, showing increased intracranial pressure. Head circumference is enlarged. An infant's head enlarges with increased intracranial pressure since fusion of the cranial sutures is incomplete. On imaging, one would suggest that this is probably due to uh, uh, hydrocephalus, and in this case, he had a uh, aqueductal stenosis and a non-communicating hydrocephalus. This patient requires a ventriculoperitoneal shunt to allow the CSF to exit the ventricles without enlarging this brain. The nice thing about pediatric neurology uh, is the direct assessment of intracranial pressure using the fontanelles because there are openings uh, through the skull that allows a person to see whether the fontanelle is bulging or whether it is sunken, suggesting dehydration. This concludes this section of Falcon Physician Reviews.